The movie begins in East New York, Brooklyn in 1955, where a young boy named Henry looks out of his bedroom window and admires the gangsters in his neighborhood. He believes being a gangster is better than being the president of the United States. He gets an after-school job at a cab stand run by Tuddy Cesario, who works for his brother, Polly Cesario, the local mob boss. At first, Henry's parents are happy that he found a job, but they soon become concerned about his involvement with the mob. Henry's father, who was sent to work at age 11, believes American kids are spoiled and lazy. Henry's mother likes that the Ciceros are from the same part of Sicily as her. However, they change their minds when they realize Henry spends more time at the cab stand than in school. Henry's father receives a letter from the school informing him that Henry hasn't been attending. He becomes angry and beats Henry, calling him a liar and a bum. Despite the beatings, Henry remains committed to the cab stand and his mob connection. Later, Henry informs Tuddy that he can't make any more deliveries because his father will kill him if he skips school again. Tuddy and other gangsters abduct the mailman responsible for delivering letters from the school to Henry's house. They threaten him and force him to agree that he will no longer deliver school letters to Henry's home. From that point on, Henry stops receiving letters from the school and becomes even more entrenched in organized crime. Polly presides over the backyard barbecue as mobsters mingle and chat. Henry's voiceover narration explains that many people depend on Polly for protection from other criminals, and that the organization is like a police department for wise guys, something the FBI can't comprehend. In a later scene at night, Henry helps Tootie commit arson at a used car lot. As he breaks car windows and sets the cars on fire, Henry reflects on how his life has changed since his association with the mob. He no longer has to wait in line at the bakery. His neighbors respect his family, and he has more money than he can spend at 13. The neighborhood kids even carry his mother's groceries out of respect. One day, Henry's mother opens their front door and is shocked by Henry's gangster-like appearance. The scene then shifts to a man running towards the pizzeria where Henry is standing, screaming that he's been shot. The man is eventually taken away by an ambulance, but Tuddy chastises Henry for wasting so many aprons on him. The setting then moves to the cab stand at night, where Henry works amidst people playing cards. He describes this time as glorious for wise guys before the Appalachian meeting in Crazy Joey's War. During this time, Henry first meets Jimmy Burke, a young but already legendary figure in the criminal world. He is a big spender, tipping generously and impressing everyone around him. Jimmy asks Henry to make him a drink, and after he brings it, Polly introduces them to each other. Henry's voiceover narration explains that Jimmy has been a feared and dangerous figure in the criminal world since childhood. His main passion is stealing, and he is one of the city's biggest hijackers. The scene shifts to show Jimmy hijacking a truck with the driver offering no resistance. In return, Jimmy even gives the driver some money, earning him the nickname Jimmy the Gent. The police, unable to stop him, eventually become his partners. The scene transitions to the cab stand parking lot, where Jimmy and Tommy are loading hijacked cigarette cartons from a truck. The two help a school crossing guard carry the cartons to her car, and as she drives off, Jimmy introduces Tommy to Henry. A police car pulls up to where they're standing. Jimmy gives the cops some cartons of cigarettes before they drive off. Later, Henry sells cartons of cigarettes to factory workers when two undercover detectives approach him. Tommy runs away as Henry is arrested. In court, Henry is defended by a mob lawyer and walks free. Jimmy greets him warmly with a $100 bill and commends him for not ratting on his friends. Polly and the crew cheer and embrace Henry for handling his first arrest like a man. In 1963, the older Henry narrates that $30 billion worth of cargo was moving through Idlewild Airport. Henry's crew stole as much of it as possible. They had friends and relatives who worked at the airport and would tip them off about incoming and outgoing shipments. If any truckers or airlines caused trouble, Polly would use his connections to intimidate them. Whenever the crew needed money, they would rob the airport. Inside Sonny's Bamboo Lounge, Henry and other mobsters gathered and discussed business. Frenchie McMahon, an Air France cargo worker, entered the lounge and was greeted by Henry. They talked at the bar about a big load coming in soon. When Sonny Bamboo, the lounge's owner, brought up Tommy's past due tab in front of the guys, Tommy became enraged and broke a bottle on his head. Later, Sonny met with Polly, seeking support against Tommy and the others. He asked Polly to become a partner in the lounge to help deal with the trouble they were causing. With Polly as a partner, Sonny had to pay him every week, regardless of how the business was doing. Polly ran up bills on the lounge's credit, knowing that nobody would pay for it. As soon as the deliveries were made, they sold the merchandise at a discount, bankrupting Sonny and ultimately burning it down. As the place burned, Tommy asked Henry for help on a double date with a girl named Diana and her friend. Henry reluctantly agreed. Tommy was enamored with Diana at the restaurant, while Karen seemed bored. Henry was eager to leave and excused himself to attend a meeting with Tuddy. They agreed to meet on the next date, but at that time Henry didn't come. So Tommy took Karen to see Henry and told Henry that you are a liar and didn't come for a date. After that, Henry liked Karen, so he promised to meet on the next date. 
On the date, Henry goes to Karen's house, meets with Karen's mother, and tells her that he is half Jewish, so she allows Henry to go on a date with Karen. He took Karen to the Copacabana, impressing her with his connections. He told her he worked in construction and was a union delegate. In the next scene, Henry and Tommy stole $420,000 from the Air France cargo area without using a gun. They gave Polly his share and celebrated their success. Later, Henry and Karen spent time at a beach club, where Henry was introduced to Karen's neighbor, Bruce. At a nightclub, Henry and Karen received champagne sent by Billy Daniels. Karen reflected on how exciting it was to be with Henry, who was well-connected at 21. At Marty Krugman's wig and beauty salon, Marty complains about Jimmy wanting more money than agreed upon. Henry tries to reason with Marty, but Jimmy attacks Marty with a telephone cord. The phone rings and Karen tells Henry that her neighbor Bruce mistreated her, prompting him to rush out of the salon. Enraged, Henry confronts Bruce and brutally beats him with a gun. Later, Henry and Karen get married in a small Jewish ceremony. Their reception is attended by Polly and the entire crime family, where Karen is introduced to many wise guys and their wives. Polly hands Karen an envelope filled with $100 bills, and she soon realizes that all the wise guys are lined up to give her similar envelopes as Henry stuffs them into a bag under the table. At Karen's mother's house, her mother questions Karen about Henry's whereabouts and the kind of person he is. Karen defends Henry, but her mother insists that normal people don't live like him. At a cosmetic party at Mickey's house, Karen listens to the other women talking about their lives and how they deal with their husbands and children. Karen realizes their lifestyle is quite different from hers and wonders if she could live that way. Back at Karen's mother's house, Karen expresses concern to Henry about the possibility of him going to prison. Henry angrily dismisses her concerns, claiming that only careless people go to jail. He reassures Karen that their criminal activities are just business. Karen starts to accept this lifestyle, seeing it as a means for blue-collar guys to make extra money by cutting corners. Later, Henry and Tommy hijack a truck. They force the driver into a car and drive off in the truck. Karen's voiceover describes how close their criminal group was, always sticking together from hospital visits to vacations, showing the normalcy of their lives despite their criminal activities and never letting outsiders in. Karen discusses how there was always some harassment from the police who wanted to search the house. Still, they usually just wanted a handout to keep quiet. Later, at Henry's bar, a wise guy from the Gambino family named Billy Batts is celebrating his release from prison. At that moment, Tommy also arrives with his girlfriend. He meets Billy Batts, and in their conversation, Billy insults Tommy, calling him a shoe shiner. Tommy gets mad at this and leaves the bar. After everyone leaves, Tommy comes back, and with Jimmy, he attacks Billy and beats him to death. They stuff him in the trunk and drive to Tommy's house to get a shovel to bury him. On the way, they hear banging from the trunk. They open it and discover that he's still alive. Tommy becomes enraged and stabs him until he dies. Henry's voiceover narrates that Billy's murder was a delicate matter, requiring good reason and approval. The scene shifts to a Sunday gathering at Polly's house. Polly inquires about a missing Gambino wise guy, Billy Batts, but Henry assures him that no one knows what happened. At the nightclub, Jimmy informs Henry about a problem with a buried body on a recently sold property. They need to exhume it before it's discovered. While cleaning his trunk, Karen asks about a foul smell, to which Henry replies he hit a skunk. Later, Janice shows her new apartment to friends. Henry explains in a voiceover that he set Janice up in the apartment so he can stay there occasionally. He also mentions that he had to straighten out her boss due to Janice's work issues. During a card game, Tommy drunkenly demands Spider, a young apprentice, to dance while shooting at his feet, accidentally injuring him. Karen, suspecting Henry of infidelity, throws the car keys out the window to prevent him from leaving. In their next game, Spider returns with a bandaged foot. When Spider finally stands up to Tommy, Tommy shoots him dead. An angered Jimmy tells Tommy he's digging the hole this time. Karen shows up at Janice's apartment, screaming at her to stay away from her husband. Later, Henry is woken up by Karen, who is holding a gun to his face, threatening to shoot him. Despite her anger, Karen admits she can't leave or hurt Henry. When Henry denies any wrongdoing, he manages to grab the gun from Karen, slaps her, and rushes out. Later in Janice's apartment, Polly and Jimmy tell Henry that Karen is upset and he needs to sort things out. Henry is sent away with Jimmy for a few days to relax. During their trip, they beat up a man who owes them money, threatening to feed him to the lions unless he pays up. Upon returning, Henry and Jimmy are arrested as the man they beat up had a sister working for the FBI who turned them in. They are found guilty and sentenced to 10 years in prison. In prison, Henry describes their elaborate dinners, with everyone contributing. He also smuggles in contraband items, including drugs to sell to other inmates. On visitation day, Karen enters wearing an oversized coat to smuggle in more contraband. She sees Janice's name on the visitor's list and confronts Henry. Upset and feeling abandoned, Karen talks about the difficulties she faces outside, with Tommy being in prison and their friends being unhelpful. Henry reassures Karen, telling her they need to help each other and forget about everyone else. 
He explains his plan to sell drugs inside the prison and assures her they'll be fine if she keeps bringing in the contraband. After four years, Henry is released from prison. Karen picks him up and returns to her small, cramped apartment. Henry tells Karen to pack their things and look for a new place. He mentions that he has money owed from a partnership and is confident it's only the beginning. They head to Polly's house for lunch, where Polly warns Henry not to get involved with drugs anymore and to be careful around Jimmy and Tommy. Despite the warning, Henry begins selling drugs again without Polly's knowledge, using Robin's apartment as a base. He quickly sees success and brings Jimmy and Tommy in on the business. Karen shows off their new house to friends Marty and Fran. Marty convinces Henry to participate in a once-in-a-lifetime Lufthansa robbery that could make them rich. In a mob hangout, all the wise guys gather to watch a basketball game, each with a specific role in the heist. Amid these preparations, Henry has everyone working, including their old babysitter Judy Wicks, who transports drugs for them. At Robin's house, Henry prepares the merchandise with Robin. During a shower, he hears a radio news broadcast about the Lufthansa heist. The scene transitions to a private Christmas party at Robert's Lounge, celebrating the heist. As Henry and Karen arrive, they are greeted by Jimmy. During the party, Fat Lewis shows off a new pink Cadillac convertible he bought for his wife Dolores as a wedding present. Jimmy becomes angry with Fat Lewis, as he had warned everyone not to buy anything conspicuous for a while since the police were watching them. Jimmy and Henry notice other characters flaunting new clothes and jewelry at the bar. Marty approaches Jimmy and Henry to demand his share of the heist money, but Jimmy walks away without acknowledging him. Henry tries to calm Marty down, promising to talk to Jimmy on his behalf. In a back room, Jimmy gives Henry a small part of his share of the heist money as a taste for now. Later, Henry brings home a large Christmas tree for his family. He gives everyone Christmas presents and Karen a thick pack of bills, suggesting she buy herself something nice. Meanwhile, Stax are killed by Tommy for not disposing of the truck from the Lufthansa heist, leaving evidence for the police to find. At Robert's lounge, the group is celebrating. Henry, concerned about the police investigation, wants to talk to Jimmy, who brushes off his worries. Tommy joins them, and Jimmy reveals that Polly has opened the books, and Tommy will be a made man. Henry is stunned to hear the news and congratulates Tommy. As they head out, Marty tries to talk to Jimmy. Henry stops Marty and tells him to stop worrying. He'll get his money later. Outside Robert's lounge, Marty confronts Jimmy and Tommy again. Jimmy agrees to talk to Marty. And as they get in the car, Tommy stabs Marty in the head. Later, Henry and Karen are woken up by Fran, who worries that Marty hasn't returned home. Henry tries to calm her down and promises to look for Marty. Later, Jimmy and Henry discuss what to tell Fran about her missing husband. As Jimmy distracts two FBI agents following him, a series of gruesome discoveries occur, with the bodies of various people connected to the robbery found dead in different locations. Despite this, Jimmy is happy as today is the day Tommy is supposed to be a made man. However, instead of being made, Tommy is killed in revenge for the murder of Billy Batts. Jimmy is devastated by this news, as he and Henry had hoped to have one of their own as a mafia member. Henry has a busy day planned for Sunday, January 11th, 1979. He starts by putting a bag of guns into his car trunk and notices a police helicopter. He has several errands to run, including dropping off guns at Jimmy's, picking up his brother Michael from the hospital, and getting some new Pittsburgh items for Judy to deliver to customers in Atlanta. Henry drops off the guns at Jimmy's, but Jimmy is upset that the silencers don't fit them and refuses to pay for them. Later, Henry spots the police helicopter again while driving. After picking up Michael from the hospital, they return home, and Henry starts preparing a big dinner. He plans to finish the dinner early so he and Karen can take care of the guns and prepare the package for Louise to take to Atlanta. At 11.30 a.m., Henry and Karen leave their house to run their errands. They notice the helicopter following them and unload the guns at Karen's mother's house. After hiding the guns in garbage cans, they shop to distract the helicopter. They eventually return to Karen's mother's house to retrieve the guns. At 3.30 p.m., they meet with the Pittsburgh dealer who laughs off Henry's paranoia and exchanges the guns for heroin. Henry then plans to return home, prepare the heroin package for Louise, and finish cooking dinner. Henry calls home to check on dinner and make sure Louise follows his instructions regarding the package. Despite his repeated warnings, Louise calls from inside the house to confirm her flight details, potentially revealing information to anyone who might be listening. Henry is frustrated by her carelessness, which could jeopardize their operation. He returns home to finish cooking. While waiting for Louise's flight, he tells his brother to watch the stove and rushes to Sandy's house to prepare the package. Later, Louise arrives, and they discuss taping the drugs to her leg. She insists on going home to get her lucky hat. As he backs up the car, an FBI agent points a gun at Henry's head, ordering him not to move. FBI agents raid the house as Karen flushes heroin down the toilet and conceals a small gun in her underwear. Henry, Louise, and Sandy are all brought into the FBI office for questioning. Henry ends up in jail, but Karen gets her mother to put her house up for bail, and he is released. He fears for his life, thinking that either Polly or Jimmy might have him killed. 
His plan is to stay alive long enough to sell off the drugs the cops didn't find and then disappear for a while. However, he finds out that Karen flushed the drugs down the toilet during the raid, and they have a heated argument about it. They eventually fall asleep holding each other, with Henry holding a gun for protection. Henry goes to see Polly to apologize for his involvement in the drug business and admits he lied to Polly's face. Polly gives him $3,000 and says he must turn his back on him. Later, Karen refuses to live their lives in hiding, but Henry insists they must leave, or they'll be killed. Meanwhile, Jimmy asks Karen about Henry's condition and says he needs to talk to him. Karen is overwhelmed with her own worries, but Jimmy offers her some money and directs her to a nearby store. However, Karen becomes suspicious and decides not to enter the store, fearing for her life. Henry and Karen's relationship is strained and Henry decides to meet Jimmy at a diner. Jimmy asks Henry to go to Florida to care for someone who ratted them out. Henry realizes that he will likely not come back alive if he goes to Florida. He ultimately decides to cooperate with the FBI and testify. Henry and Karen are discussing their new life under witness protection at the FBI office. They express concerns about their new location, with Henry not wanting to go anywhere cold and Karen worried about the children's schooling. Agent McDonald assures them the FBI will handle these matters. Meanwhile, in Gefkan's bar, Polly is arrested by FBI agents. The scene transitions to a courtroom, where Henry reflects on how easy it was for him and his family to disappear since everything was registered under different names. He laments leaving the life of crime, reminiscing about the luxuries and power they had. Jimmy and Polly receive a prison sentence of 20 to life. The scene then moves to a quiet street in a Midwestern town where Henry now lives. He complains about the lack of action and the quality of the food as he retrieves the milk and newspaper from his doorstep. He explains how he's now an average nobody and will have to live the rest of his life like a snook.